Well, they're over there now setting it up. Yep. So yeah, yeah. If you want to dash over there, you need to get this sorted out. So is he over there right now? Can you see me? Okay. Okay. Just coming back. If uh, presenting. Can you hear? Can you hear you? Uh, yeah. It, it's uh, broadcasting. Yeah. Okay. I have been talking to him. I can hang up and you can call me back next. Um. So, should there be any difficulties, I'm sure to make sure that you guys are aware of that. So, that way, you can forestall any major disasters of any sort. I'm talking that I know has long since stopped making sense. Are you getting so? Yeah. Sure, that's no problem. One, one second, please. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, yes. Okay, thank I'll you. Wrap my bowl. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try right now. Certainly, I'm right here, uh, talking clearly into the microphone um, this evening. Oh, absolutely do that. Okay, bye. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is probably, hopefully, the level at which the conversation will be. Certainly, we will make every endeavor to ensure that there is much clarity in the conversation, and we will make every effort that we can to try to ensure that you are getting the maximum out of this lecture that you can. Now I could just start reading things, like our presentation of Richard Ford on uh, Friday, February 28th at 7.30 p.m. in the McNally Theatre Auditorium, St. Mary's University. Just remember that uh, admission is free, all are welcome, however, seating is limited. Proof positive that I can read. I hope this is actually getting you what it is that you need. And I'm loath to think, Matt, on the other end, that I'm actually finding it hard for words, a feat you thought I would never accomplish. But yet, here I am. Give me a call if it is if there's anything else that you need. Okay, thank you. So the only the only possible yeah, the only possible solution I can think of. Um, the I'm sorry, what? In the in the original programming that the, the people did, yes, okay. there would be testing one two. So I'm not getting it at the moment. Well, you're actually getting. No, well, I have oh, it on. Oh, you're not getting the uh, the feedback. That the hissing that I was getting a moment ago. I don't have the ear that <laughs> some yeah. people have, but it was really uh, the. There, there was a very, there was a high frequency yes. um, uh, feedback that was happening a little bit. Uh, the, the placement, the placement truly is critical for this. You need to be, you need to be able to be behind where the speakers are. Yes. Because um, what's what's getting, what's what's walking away are the is the high frequency response. 
and you have everything else turned up. One of the things that we can try to do to be able to mitigate that is when they're done here. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just going to we should turn this thing. So specifically, your podium, yep. which is also a condenser mic, uh -huh. and those are those are a cardioid condenser. Sorry, those are a condenser that it, that are presented on those as well. Okay. So, so certainly, if, if if minimally, you can turn off the the podium mic. Just reach over and turn it down. Yes, I'll mention that to. Uh... Because, yeah, because the the audience mics will not have a tremendous amount of effect. No. Their their polar pattern is such that oh, they're, being, they're yep. not going to be picking up very much up anyway. Yep. But uh, it's a cumulative effect when you get the really high oh, yeah. frequency like that. So having a whole bunch of mics on. Well, I haven't gotten the call back. You okay? Okay, um, Lindsay. Um, there you go. So I think um, I think we have the capacity here for a very nice conversation. Um, yeah, I certainly help. Uh, yeah, I I think quite honestly, as I mentioned, I I think that the issue is having a very very. Um, sensitive condenser mic, it's it just yes. makes it particularly on the high end. So I think we have to be in pretty decent shape here um, on this part. And are you getting? Yeah, I'm getting that great. Can somebody um, tell speak into that mic just so I can match level? Oh, it's, there comes Alex. He's coming out of the aisle now. He's going to kind of free Okay. Uh, now, now, in all fairness, however, we're going to turn the the challenge that we have is that when we turn on that mic. It's going to cause the feedback issues yeah, that we were getting. Yeah. Okay. So, so we've actually turned that off, Alex. I'm just going to mute this for a second. Um, good evening, and uh, this is uh, Full Voice for this particular session and on this particular mic. I can now mute this and go over to the other one. 
I have now um, I have now muted um, the other mic. I'm over here having a chat with Lindsay. When up when now?
Yes. Where are they coming over here?
This thing sucks up battery power. I hate for you. To, just when you're ready to let loose of the real jam.
Uh, thank you all uh, for being uh, here with us this evening. Can you hear me in the back? Great, thank you. Wonderful musician. Let's uh, give them another round of applause. For Uh, my name is David Goche. I'm the Vice President of Academic and Research at St. Mary's University. Uh, thank you for being with us here this evening. Um, before we begin this evening, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, how difficult it is for many of us here uh, today in light of the tragic news about our student, Loretta Saunders. Um, I want to thank all of you who've shared your strength uh, with us uh, in this time and the support that uh, many of you have shown to Loretta's family. We are a community who cares for and about each other, as you friends of St. Mary's have shown us time and time again, and I thank you for that. And it's into this caring community uh, this evening that we've invited our guest, Richard Ford, uh, who honors us all with his presence. Uh, it is uh, very appropriate here at the Cyril Byrne Lecture, which has become a highlight uh, for the academic year at St. Mary's, uh, for... Uh, for him to join us this evening and for you to be here with us in this celebration of, a, uh, of learning as a wonderful gift that you give us and the testament to the memory of Cyril Byrne. We are all served so well by our faculty, students and staff uh, in our Irish Studies program, our Atlantic Canada Studies program, our Department of English, the Gorsebrook Research Institute for Atlantic Canada Studies, and the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Culture and our Faculty of Arts. Uh, thank, uh, I thank them all so much for everything they've done to make this evening possible. Uh, and on behalf of all of the faculty, students, and staff of St. Mary's University, welcome to our home. And I hope uh, for many of you it feels like your home and you can sit back this evening relax and enjoy an evening of conversation and music. Thank you. Uh, my name is John McKinnon. I teach in the philosophy department here at St. Mary's and I'm very honored to have been asked to uh, introduce uh, Richard Ford tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Alexander McLeod, who's organized pretty well the entire night. <clears throat> and I also want to thank him for inviting me to uh, participate. Um, the sensible thing for me to have done would be to show up with, uh, you know, a, a meticulously prepared script detailing the accomplishments of Richard Ford, the titles of the books he's published, the literary awards that he's won, uh, the international acclaim that he's enjoyed. Uh, but I've decided not to do that uh, for two reasons. I assume he gets that all the time everywhere he goes, for one thing. Uh, but also I thought that um, a better way to convey my sense of uh, honor and privilege at introducing him would be to share with you a series of uh, modest anecdotes. So the first one, uh, about 13 years ago, 13 or 14 years ago, um, I was in my office here at St. Mary's and my father phoned me from southern Maine. He knew how, how much I enjoyed and admired the writing of Richard Ford and he informed me that Ford was scheduled to give a reading at the Portland uh, Public Library and I think he just wanted to let me know this. It was sometime in the springtime, classes were over here, marking was done, so it occurred to me I could just jump in the car and head down to Portland and spend some time with my folks catch the Ford reading and uh, ask a question. I had a question for him too. And then uh, return to uh, Halifax. Uh, now, as it happens, I was applying that year for tenure at St. Mary's. And it turned out that the day that the review committee, the review committee is the committee that reviews applications for tenure and promotion. And the day that they were scheduled to meet was the very day that Richard Ford was giving his reading down in Portland. And the academic vice president of the day informed me that uh, I should really be in the vicinity wh when they were meeting, just in case they wanted to summon me to interrogate me about in some inflated claim I was making about myself. Um, so I really ideally had to be in my office by the phone. Uh, and if, one, if, if there's one thing that philosophy has taught me, it's that if I had to be here, I couldn't be there. Um, <laughs> So, uh, 
I asked my father to go in my stead, and I told him the question that I wanted uh, him to ask Richard Ford, should the opportunity present itself. So my father was happy to do this, and he threw on his jacket, grabbed the car keys, and as soon as he set foot, he later told me, as soon as he set foot on the porch outside, <clears throat> nosing into our driveway was a car with Nova Scotia plates, visitors from home. And uh, he told me, I don't know who these people were, but he told me later on that uh, even if they weren't interfering with his afternoon plans of uh, taking in a Richard Ford reading, uh, he wouldn't have chosen to spend the afternoon uh, with these people. So, so I imagine him in that frozen moment, considering his options, uh, perhaps darting behind the garage and hiding while my mother let the visitors in, and then making a mad dash for the car, and then to steal a line from Frank Bascom, ramming the car to the driveway like a desperado and racing into Portland to, to catch the Richard Ford reading and asking my question. Um, but I assume also that he had a second thought about that first thought. And the second thought was that the fair and compassionate thing to do would be to stay with my mother and try to navigate their way through the afternoon of, uh, of tea and cake and chat. So that possibility of, an, of uh, listening to and uh, talking to possibly uh, Richard Ford went begging that year. But a year later, uh, my father phoned again to tell me that Richard Ford was scheduled to give another reading at the Portland Public Library. Now, in the meantime, I had, a, I had an infant son, so I figured I, uh, I couldn't just pick up and go as I had the previous year. I also, of course, had tenure now. And, um, and um, it, it's well known that tenure sort of uh, drains a bit of initiative out of you. So, um, so again, I, I deputized my father and um, reminded him of my question. And this time, everything went without a hitch. And uh, he told me later on how much he enjoyed the reading, how gracious Richard Ford was. And um, Richard Ford thanked him for his question, which we all know was my question. And, um, and um, yeah, so that went, that went very well. Uh, and before I finish here tonight, perhaps I'll tell you what the question was. Um, one of the last phone conversations I had with my father, we actually discussed at fair length uh, Richard Ford's writing. I think there must have been a new paperback out at the time. It might have been The Lay of the Land, the last of the three um, uh, uh, Frank Bascom novels. And I was saying to my father, <clears throat> I'm sure it wasn't for the first time, but I said to him, um, you know, I really love this guy's writing. I, and as the cliche has it, uh, when I'm reading one of his books, I have a hard time putting it down. And once I put it down, I, I can't wait to pick it up again. And yet, I'm not sure why. Because the Bascom novels, for instance, run about 450, 500 pages each, and they cover about maybe four days in Frank Bascom's life. There's a lot of recollecting to earlier periods of his life, but, you know, four days in Frank's life. And Frank is, um, he's increasingly endearing to me over the years, but he's, he's not what you would call an extraordinary guy, I don't think. Frank himself, in the sports writer, says there's no such thing as an ordinary person. Um, but if Frank is unordinary, he's not that unordinary, I don't think. Um, so here's where I resort to the language of critics, because sometimes you will um, read on dust jackets or in book reviews references made to how finely observed uh, a novel is or how finely observed a story or collection of stories is. Uh, and it's this, I think, above all, that we look for in great novelists and that we respect and admire in them. Uh, Eudora Welty, Alice Munro, Mavis Gallant, and indeed uh, Richard Ford. Uh, one example is um, a chapter about three quarters of the way through, I could come up with many, but uh, one that comes to mind is a chapter about three quarters of the way through his current novel, Canada, when the lead character, D Par D uh, yeah, sorry, Del Parsons, um, who's uh, recalling the, the summer and winter of his 15th year, about 50 years later. So he's about 65, recalling when he was 15. And he's in a, um, a cafe called the Modern Cafe in Leader, Saskatchewan, with a man who fascinates him, Arthur Remlinger. And this, the, the, the chapter goes on for maybe five or six pages. The description of them sharing lunch uh, is, you know, maybe three pages but it's so meticulously and, and wonderfully pulled off. Um, the description of 
of Dell's observations of Arthur, uh, the slight changes in mood and in uh, expression. Um, you can almost hear the the clatter of dishes in the background in the in the in the restaurant and uh, the chime of of um, of silverware, the talk of the other customers, the warmth inside as the light in the Saskatchewan December afternoon starts to change a bit and the snow begins to fall. It's just wonderful writing. Um, and in all of the uh, Frank Bascom novels, so many reflections by Frank on life, bereavement, the people he loves, the people he doesn't love, the state of the nation, the state of the union, the state of his own self. Uh, they're always intelligent, um, so often incisive, and very often funny. Um, I often find myself laughing out loud when I read uh, Richard Ford's novels. Uh, so it's all, it all comes down to the writing, is, is the answer, I suppose. Now my question, all those years ago. Um, it was, it's simple enough, but deceptively so, because what I wanted my father to ask was um, there were, had been two Frank Bascom novels, A Sports Writer and Independence Day, and there were several years there before the third one came along, and I wanted to know whether the third one was coming along. So that was the question. Are you planning to, are you in the midst of even writing a third Frank Bascom novel? And the answer was yes. And this is what I was waiting for, because my follow-up question, had I been there myself, would have been, um, my suspicion was that if there was a third one, that Richard Ford was... This was evidence that Richard Ford was trying to trace through the life of Frank Bascom the three stages of life as articulated by Soren Kierkegaard, the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. Now, um, <laughs> my father uh, said, I'm not even going to look over there. Um, my father said how gracious Richard Ford was he, and, and uh, you know, grateful for his question. But uh, I suspect he would have been a bit less gracious had I been there to ask the follow-up question. Uh, this, is, this is a view, in, incidentally, that I don't think there's much to. I was an overeager uh, young academic at the time. Um, in any case, um, I promise in the question and answer period later on, I promise everybody, especially Richard Ford, I won't even mention Kierkegaard's name. Um, he can if he wants, but I won't. Um, so without further ado, it's a great honor on behalf of uh, St. Mary's University and everybody here uh, to welcome this year's Cyril Byrne Memorial Lecturer, one of the world's great writers, not just novelists, short story writers, great essayists, uh, Richard Ford. What, what you don't know is that I have a picture of myself here st staring at me, so I, I don't know what to do about that. I'll find something to do in a minute, I guarantee you. Um, thank you, John. Where'd you go? There you are. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice President Gautier. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Um, I'm honored to be at St. Mary's today, tonight, um, to be in Halifax and to deliver the Cyril Byrne Lecture. Um, I know it's a somber time, but you know the university is part of life. The university is part of the world. It's, it seems like it's a sheltered place, but it's not. We hope that literature can in some way console us, you know. Uh, that's what it's for. Now let me just get this out of the way or nobody will be able to sit still. Congratulations to the Canadian hockey team for the gold medal. <laughs> You're better than we are. You're much better than we are. Thank you to the musicians wherever they went. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thanks a lot. Um, it's great to be here. Um, it's just the high season. Um, Alexander very kindly asked me if I'd read to you a, a passage of uh, this work that I've been doing. Um, 
a book of four novellas called Let Me Be Frank With You. Um, I've written, as John said, three long novels, written a lot of things since 1982, but three long novels were three of them narrated by Frank Bascom, as John was saying. These, no these novels are about a man who begins life as we find it as the sports writer, and then he's lost a child, um, divorced his wife, becomes what all Americans will eventually become, which is to say a real estate agent, if we live long enough. Um, he has, he's married, marries another woman whom he loves. He loved his first wife too. That happens. Um, I've been married to my wife for 50 years, so um, I have a lot of friends who said, I've, I've been married 50 years, but I've been married to four people. Um, but what um, what these novellas are, are set to is, uh, in 2012, um, the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy in the state of New Jersey, because the, the sports writer and Independence Day and the lay of the land are all set in New Jersey. And um, my wife and I uh, went over uh, to the shore, in the Jersey shore, after Hurricane Sandy, and we we just we, we just went over there like gawkers, you know, just rubberneckers. We wanted to see what went on, and I just realized I could hear myself narrating things in Frank's voice, and I thought, well, you don't get these things as a novelist. These are what Henry James calls donnés, givens, and so I was given that, and I thought, well, I haven't ever done anything like that before. Set something against the in the aftermath and against the background of, a, of, of something such as Hurricane Sandy, not that there's anything like that. But I thought, well, okay, that's my that's my choice. I'll, I'll try to do that. As I say, it's um, it's it's Christmas uh, around the Christmas time, in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. Um, I just wrote this stuff this uh, this month, and um, I'm terrified uh, to, to to read it. Uh, I, um, it's called The New Normal. It's the third of three novellas. There's one more which I've also written. I've, I've written all the stories now. I just have to edit them. And I did happily edit this a little bit today. <laughs> now I know what to do about him. <laughs> Cover him up. This, uh, this story is set in Haddam, New Jersey, which is set in the middle of the state of New Jersey in what most people would consider the area around Princeton Heights town. Out the Haddam Great Road, just past 5 p.m., freezing rain has turned the road surface into a free-for-all after our skating rink. Only a few of us are braving it, our headlights glaring up and out like sheeny novas off the blacktop. A Ford Explorer why is it always a Ford Explorer? <laughs> Has already gone in the ditch, its driver waving me philosophically on, a shrug and a high sign I return, a wrecker's on its way. Often the trees on both sides, great houses are lit up bright for Christmas, twinkling garlands strung through the oak boughs, great arrow shaped, perfectly formed, all one color lights, blue or white are most favored, yuletide spruces, are geometrically framed inside great picture windows, sharing the Christmas spirit with the less moneyed, seeking a rift. Years ago, I drove out here on just such a gloomy wintry night to hand deliver a $2 million full price offer on a slant roof architecture design monstrosity that has since been torn down and calamitously hit a dog precisely next door to the house I was at that moment selling. As with the Explorer, I went right in the ditch but clambered out and across the black ice road to bring whatever helpless help I could to the poor, distressed creature which had made a whomp when I hit it, boating ill. I, of course, feared it was my client's dog. <laughs> there, indeed, the poor thing lay in the ice-crusted grass in front of number 2697, breathing deep, rasping, not long for this world's size its big contemplative eyes resignedly open to the snowy night, its last, but offering not to move or even to notice me on my frozen knees, my cold, my <clears throat> cold hand on its hard, hairy ribs, feeling them rise and fall, rise and fall. 
It was a great hound, a black and tan, somebody's old love bug, a wiggly crotch sniffer and shoe chewer bought for the kids but surviving on long after they'd gone on with life and prime now to be hit. What can I do for you, Towser? I said these absurd words, knowing their answer was, nothing but thanks, you've done enough. Eventually, I hiked up to the modern house I was representing, shamefacedly and somewhat in shock myself. I informed my clients of what I'd terribly done. We all three went down to the road, but the old boy by then had passed beyond us and was, because it was damn cold, grown stiff and peaceful and perfect. No one knew whose dog it was, a hunter's dog, straight away in the night, they thought, though it was long past any season. My clients, the Yakabuchis, long since beyond life's pale themselves, felt a piteous sorrow for me and my plight, and let me go home with the promise to do something about the dog the next morning. They said, I mustn't worry. It was a terrible night to be out, which it was, in my realty memory. They accepted the offer after some testy back and forth with the buyer, though I have an optimistic and faulty memory about such matters. It was a long time ago, 30 years at least, though the dog, of course, lives on. I am tonight on my pilgrim's weary way. Again, it's barely five o'clock, but could be midnight. The clock sprang back almost to zero six weeks ago on my way to visit my former wife, Ann Dykstra, now a resident of the Ruth Wessel Wing of the community at Carnage Hill, a state-of-the-art staged care facility deep in what was once when we were married and lived in Haddam 40 years ago, the Haddam Township hinterlands. Today, the community is hard by a Robert Trent Jones Championship Lynx course hidden from the Great Road by a smattering of trees, the leaves now gone. A birch bark canoe institute sits straight off to the left in the deeper woods, its lights busily yellowing the snow flittery night with enterprise. Other larger houses sit semi-visibly farther back on other roads accessible by gates with armed attendants. It seems to me it used to be possible to cast your eye over almost any place of settled landscape and see how it would look in the future what uses it might be put to by succeeding waves of humanity as if a kind of indelible spatial logic lay buried in every human use containing the genome of its later what's it. But out here in these failed hinterlands, all is frankly enigma to me. It's probably my age, which explains more and more of everything about me like a master decryption code breaker in New Jersey, we've now built out to within a scant million acres of the last remotely developable land so that by current estimates, we're on track to use it all up by mid-century. Property taxes are capped. No one wants to sell a house if they don't have to because no one wants to buy another one, all of which keeps prices sky high in spite of actual values being low. I've passed only one lonely Sotheby's tonight the whole way out here. Householders of expensive manses, many along this way, are renting their 8,000-square-foot trophy villas to bands of Rutgers students with rich parents and taking the long view about upkeep and potential damage when the lease is up. Meanwhile, towns like Haddam are suffering constant service set uh, cutbacks. The middle isn't holding was the newspaper's glum Yatesian assessment for their Thanksgiving double realty issue. Too much money's going to wages, the Republicans on our borough council decided. Not enough back to services. There's a budget gap of 15 mil, which has caused some well-liked, comfortable old shoe town fixtures to be pink-slipped in the days before Christmas. To further offset these shortfalls, strategic deletions have occurred. The old manger scene, mothballed years ago, with all the wise men looking like strapping Aryans instead of dusky-skinned Levantines, have been recycled since the rental company for the newer scene upped their prices. Holly boughs, 
now adorn only every third lamppost on Seminary Street. Santa's own Clyde lit magic sleigh on the square now boasts a smaller Santa at the helm than previous years. The size appropriate Santa was stolen, possibly by the Rutgers students, and now is in one of the very houses I'm passing. A substitute Santa was found online. <laughs> possibly I am the only one paying attention to all this but I have time to. I still possess an acute municipal memory due to my years selling and reselling, mortgaging and remortgaging, finally overseeing the raising and replacing of many a dream home, plus owning three myself, which one of which, the last, I now live in. But every citizen I pass a word with, admittedly not that many, seems stolidly on board with the new austerity which promises an eventual dead stop to what was once our reality, as if feeling the pinch and cinching the belt up a notch makes all us feel we're integral parts of the communal worldwide disaster, which we know to be bad, but really not that bad, not here, not yet. We're global citizens joined together by feeling vestigial and burdened. Three Seminary Street storefronts, I should say, are currently empty. Heresy in my earlier days. Townhouse construction, a well-known morbid sign, is going apace right across the street from where my first son, Ralph Bascom, lies buried under a linden tree lately blown down by the hurricane. Rumor has it a dollar store may buy in where the Laura Ashley was. A coyote with a cat in its mouth was seen two streets over from us. Clearly some emotional scar has marred our psyche. It is an enigma how it will all sort out by the time the sprawlable land's used up and there's no place left to go except away and down, which is where I'll be by then. That's enough to leave there. Oh, for, for him. Thank you very much. I, I will enshroud him here. <laughs> should be should be black, I think. Uh, I'd never read that before. I, I just really wrote that. Uh, but well, I wrote it this morning. You have to write something. <laughs> you have to write something sometime. You know. Um, what I'm going to do now uh, with with enthusiasm, is uh, re read to you the beginning of Canada, just a little bit at the beginning, and re then read you the last bit, more or less the last bit. Um, and, and so it's, 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 the, it's the part that actually takes place in Windsor, Ontario. Canada is a book about a, a, a boy whose parents commit a, an armed robbery because they get terrified of being in debt to some, what we in America still call Indians. I know it's a here, but we, I mean, my mother's Osage, so I get to say anything I want. <laughs> um, um, when his parents commit a robbery, they're immediately thrown into jail, and he, my narrator, and his sister are basically left alone and unprotected, and the, the services, the, the, the city services in Great Falls, Montana in 1960 don't even pay any attention to them, so the little girl who they're 15, they wander away. And the little boy is taken away across the border into Saskatchewan because his mother has prepared this for him. Actually, she wanted the little girl to go too, but the little girl ran away. This little boy, Dale Parsons, is taken off to Saskatchewan where he endures some terrible things and eventually uh, outlives it all and um, goes to college in, in Manitoba and um, marries a Canadian girl from Manitoba and uh, finishes his life as a teacher in Windsor, Ontario. Um, so what I'm going to do is read the beginning of the book and then read the part about Windsor. Um, we're in Canada here. <laughs> Happily. Uh, Seth Snodaboom, I don't know if you know Seth Snodaboom. He's a wonderful um, Dutch writer, probably somebody who will have a chance to win the Nobel Prize if you just stay alive. Uh, 
I, I saw him the other night, and, and he, he said to me now, he said, okay, he said, Fort High, he said, now you live in Canada, don't you? I said, well, almost. <laughs> this is the beginning. First, I'll tell about the robbery our parents committed, then about the murders, which happened later. The robbery is the more important part since it served to, to set my and my sister's lives on the courses they eventually followed. Nothing would make complete sense without that being told first. Our parents were the least likely two people in the world to rob a bank. They weren't strange people, not obviously criminals. No one would have thought they were destined to end up the way they did. They were just regular, though, though of course, that kind of thinking became null and void the moment they did rob a bank. My father, Bev Parsons, was a country boy, born in Marengo County, Alabama in 1923 and came out of high school in 1939, burning to be in the Army Air Corps, the branch that became the Air Force. He went in at Demopolis, Alabama, trained at Randolph near San Antonio, longed to be a fighter pilot, but lacked the aptitude and so learned bombardiering instead. He flew the B-25s, the light medium Mitchells, that were seeing duty in the Philippines and later over Osaka, where they rained destruction on the earth, both on the enemy and undeserving people alike. He was a tall, winning, smiling, handsome, six-footer. He barely fitted into his bombardier's compartment with a big, square, expectant face and knobby cheekbones and sensuous lips and long, attractive feminine eyelashes. He had white shiny teeth and short black hair he was proud of, as he was of his name, Bev, Captain Bev Parsons. He never conceded that Beverly was a woman's name in most people's minds. It grew from Anglo-Saxon roots, he said. It's a common name in England. Vivian, Gwen, Shirley are men's names there. No one confuses them with women. He was a nonstop talker, was open-minded for a southerner, had graceful, obliging manners that should have taken him far in the Air Force, but didn't. His quick, hazel eyes would search around any room he was in, finding someone to pay attention to him, my sister and me, ordinarily. He told corny jokes in a southern theatrical style, could do card tricks and magic tricks, could detach his thumb and replace it, make a handkerchief disappear and come back. He could play boogie-woogie piano and sometimes would talk Dixie to us, and sometimes like Amos and Andy. He had lost some of his hearing by flying the Mitchells and was sensitive about it. But he looked sharp in his honest GI haircut and blue captain's tunic and generally conveyed a warmth that was genuine and made my twin sister and me love him. It was also probably the reason my mother had been attracted to him, though they couldn't have been more unsuited and different and luckily, unluckily gotten pregnant from their one hasty encounter after meeting at a party honoring returned airmen near where he was retraining to learn supply officer duties at Fort Lewis, Washington in March 1945, when no one needed him to drop bombs anymore. They were married immediately when they found out her parents, who lived in Tacoma and were Jewish immigrants from Poland, didn't approve. They were educated mathematics teachers and semi-professional musicians and popular concertizers in Poznan who'd escaped after 1918 and come to Washington State through Canada and became, of all things, school custodians. Being Jews meant little to them by then or to our mother, just an old, exacting, constricted, conception of life they were happy to put behind them in a land where there apparently were no Jews. But for their only daughter to marry a smiling, talkative only son of Scotch-Irish Alabama backwoods timber estimators was never in their thinking. And they soon put it out of their thinking altogether. And while from a distance it may seem that our parents were merely not made for one another, it was more true that when our mother married our father, it betokened a loss, and their life changed forever, and not in a good way, as she surely must have believed. <clears throat> My mother, Neva Camper, 
short for Geneva, was a tiny, intense, bespectacled woman with unruly brown hair, downy vestiges of which ran down her jawline. She had thick eyebrows and a shiny, thin-skinned forehead under which her veins were visible and a pale indoor complexion that made her appear fragile, which she wasn't. My father jokingly said people where he was from in Alabama called her hair Jew hair or immigrant hair, but he liked it and loved her. She never seemed to pay these words much attention. She had small, delicate hands whose nails she kept manicured and shined and was vain about and gestured with absently. She owned a skeptical frame of mind, was an intent listener when we talked to her and had a wit that could turn biting. She wore frameless glasses, read French poetry, used terms like cauchemar or trop de cool, which my sister and I didn't understand. She wrote poems in brown ink, bought through the mail, and kept a journal we weren't permitted to read and normally had a slightly nose-elevated, astigmatized expression of perplexity, which became true of her and may always have been true. Before she married my father and quickly had my sister and me, she'd graduated at 18 from Whitman College in Walla Walla, had worked in a bookstore, featured herself possibly as a bohemian and a poet, and had hoped someday to land a job as a studious small college instructor married to someone different from who she did marry, conceivably a college professor, which would have given her the life she believed she was intended for. She was only 34 in 1960, the year these events occurred, but she already had serious lines beside her nose, which was small and pinkish at its tip, and her large penetrating gray-green eyes had dusky lids that made her seem foreign and slightly sad and dissatisfied, which she was. She possessed a pretty thin neck and a sudden unexpected smile that showed off her small teeth and girlish heart-shaped mouth, though it was a smile she rarely practiced, except on my sister and me. We realized she was an unusual-looking person, dressed as she typically was in olive color slacks and baggy sleeve cotton blouses and hemp and cotton shoes she must have sent away to the West Coast for, since you couldn't buy such things in Great Falls. And she only seemed more unusual, standing reluctantly beside our tall, handsome, outgoing father, though it was rarely the case that they went out as a family or ate in restaurants so that we hardly noticed how they appeared in the world among strangers. To us, life in our house seemed normal. My sister and I could easily see why my mother would have been attracted to Bev Parsons, big plank-shouldered, talkative, forever funny, wanting to please anybody who came in range, but it was never completely obvious why he would take an interest in her, tiny, barely five feet, inward and shy, alienated, artistic, pretty only when she smiled and witty, only when she felt completely comfortable. He must have somehow just appreciated all that, sensed she had a subtler mind than his, but that he could please her, which made him happy. It was to his good credit that he looked beyond their physical differences to the heart of things human, which I admired, even if it wasn't in our mother to notice. Still, the odd union of their mismatched physical attributes always plays in my mind as part of the reason they ended up badly. They were no doubt simply wrong for each other and should never have married or done any of it, should have gone their separate ways after their first passionate encounter, no matter its outcome. The longer they stayed on and the better they knew each other, the better she at least could see their mistake and the more misguided their lives became like a long proof in mathematics in which the first calculation is wrong, following which all other calculations move you further away from how things were when they made sense. A sociologist of those times, the beginning of the 60s, might say our parents were in the vanguard of an historical moment, were among the first who transgressed society's boundaries, embraced rebellion, believed in credos, requiring ratification through self-destruction, but they weren't. They weren't reckless people in the vanguard of anything. They were, as I said, regular people, tricked by circumstance and bad instincts, along with bad luck, to venture outside of the boundaries they knew to be right and then found themselves unable to go back. 
Oh, that's the beginning. No. Thank you. Thank you very much. What happens, as I said, is that Dell Dell goes to Saskatchewan and gets involved with this man whom John mentioned, Arthur Bremlinger, who's a psychopath and, and, and who commits desperate murders in front of him and um, makes him bury these two helpless Americans out on in a goose pit in Saskatchewan. And then there's a and then there's a stop in the action and the action takes up again in part three. Part one is in Montana, part two is in Saskatchewan, part three is in Windsor, Ontario, where he's Dell. 60 something years old. I forget how old I am. Um, 70. Um, and um, he's retiring from his job as a teacher in um, in Windsor. And, and, and I'll read a little bit of that. I have always counseled my students to think on the long life of Thomas Hardy, born. 1840, died 1928, to think on all he saw, the changes his life comprehended over such a period. I try to encourage in them the development of a life concept to enlist their imagination, to think of their existence on the planet, not as just a catalog of random events endlessly unspooling, but as a life, both abstract and finite. This as a way of taking account. I teach them books that, to me, seem secretly about my own life, The Heart of Darkness, The Great Gatsby, The Sheltering Sky, The Nick Adams Stories, The Mayor of Casterbridge, A Mission into the Void, Abandonment, A Figure, Possibly Mysterious, but Finally Not. These books aren't taught now to high school students in Canada. Who knows why? My conceit is always crossing a border, adaptation, development from a way of living that doesn't work toward one that does. It can also be about crossing a line and never being able to come back. Along the way, I tell them, if not the facts, at least some of the lessons of my long life, that to encounter me now at 66 is to be unable to imagine me at 15, which will be true of them, and not to hunt too hard for hidden or opposite meanings even in the books they read, but to look as much as possible straight at the things they can see in broad daylight. In the process of articulating to yourself the things you see, you'll always pretty well make sense and learn to accept the world. It may not seem precisely natural to them to do this. One of them will often say, I don't see what this has to do with us. I say back, does everything have to be about you? Can you not project yourself outside yourself? Can you not take on another's life for your own benefit? It's then that I'm tempted to tell them about my young life in its entirety, to tell them teaching is a gesture of serial non-abandonment of them, the vocation of a boy who loved school. I always feel I have a lot to teach them and not much time, a bad sign. Retirement comes for me at a good moment. It's well and long accepted that I'm American, though I've been naturalized and have held a passport for 35 years. A decades ago, married a Canadian girl fresh from college in Manitoba. I own my own house on Monmouth Street in Windsor, Ontario, have taught English at the Walkerville Collegiate Institute since 1981. <clears throat> my colleagues are polite about my forsaken Americanness. Occasionally, someone asks if I don't long to go back. I say, not at all. It's right there across the river. I can see it. <laughs> they seem both supportive of my choices. Canadians think of themselves as natural acceptors, tolerators, understanders, but also are impatient nearly to the point of resentment that I even had to make a choice. My students who are 17 and 18 are generally amused by me. They tell me I talk like a yank, even though I don't, and tell them there's no difference. I tell them it's not hard to be Canadian. Kenyans and Indians and Germans do it with ease. And I had so little training to be American anyway. They want to know if I was a draft dodger long ago. Why they even know about that, I can't fathom, since history is not what they study. I tell them I was a Canadian conscript, and Canada saved me from a fate worse than death, which they understand to mean America. 
Sometimes they jokingly ask me if I changed my name. I assure them I did not. Impersonation and deception, I tell them, are the great themes of American literature. But in Canada, not so much. After a while, I don't chime in anymore. Canada did not save me. I tell them it did only because they wanted to be true. If my parents hadn't done what they did, if they'd survived as parents, my sister and I would have gone along to find American lives and been happy. They simply didn't, so we didn't. Over the years, my wife and I have taken an occasional vacation down below. We have no children that represent, in a sense, the end of our respective lines, so we've gone only where we've wanted, skipping Orlando and Orange County and Yellowstone, tending instead toward the significant historical and cultural sites, Chautauqua, the Pettus Bridge, Concord in D.C., which my wife Claire considers a bit much, but I consider to be fine. <laughs> I've enrolled in summer institutes taught by Harvard professors, visited the Mayo Clinic once, and we've often driven down and through on our trips back to Manitoba. I've never been back to Great Falls, but I've been told it's a friendlier town, still a town, not a city, much better than when we lived there in 1960, and I was whisked away forever. None of that taking me over the border could happen now since the towers, and with the border being sealed, it is a long time ago. My parents assume an even smaller place in memory. I often remember my friend Charlie Quarters saying to me as we sat in lawn chairs watching geese that something went out of him when he drove back to Canada from the lower 48. I feel the opposite. Something always feels at peace in me when I come back. If anything goes out, it's something I want to be out. On a driving trip to Vancouver, we did once stop in the town of Fort Royal, Saskatchewan. My wife knows everything about those days and is sympathetic and slightly curious, since I don't repeat the memories over and over. I told her once when we were young, assuming she should know, and since then have not much revisited it. Fort Royal itself was scarcely there. The drugstore, the empty library, the empty brick school, all gone. No trace. Two rows of empty buildings, a co-op gas station, a post office, the disused elevator. The train yard was in operation, but seemed smaller. Oddly, the abattoir, called now Custom Prairie Meats, persisted. And the little Queen of Snows hotel, with a portable sign out front saying, Goose shooters, fall's coming, book your hunts. The Leonard Hotel itself was among the missing, its space at the edge of town, disclosing no sign of it. It was summer, early July, and the harvests hadn't yet commenced. Most of the town residents were still there on the short, squared streets, many with the maple leaf flying, non-existent 50 years ago. But there seemed to be no place for someone to work. Everyone drove, I supposed, to Swift Current or farther. Partreau, Saskatchewan, which we later drove past, was altogether gone. Even the elevator husk. It was as if a great vengeful engine had come through and plowed it under and salted the earth. I drove us out into the wheat fields, the crop thick and undulant. The sky was high and clear blue, the hot wind gusting and dusty and dotted with snapping grasshoppers. Hawks patrolled, lazing in the great warm dome or sitting sentry in a single tree here and there. I didn't say so, but I drove us to the extent memory could lead me near to the place we buried the Americans. It's odd how a piece of ground can hold so little of its meaning, though that's lucky, since for it to do so would make places sacred but impenetrable, whereas they're otherwise neither. Instead, it all becomes part of our complex mind, to which, if we're lucky, we can finally <clears throat> assent. The great fields of grain swayed and hissed and shifted colors and bent and lay back against the wind where we stopped our car. I got out and breathed in the rich odors of dust and wheat and something vaguely spoiled, a thin scene only. The Americans lay under their ground as they would have by now even had they lived on longer. I stood 
hands in my trouser pockets, toes in the dust, and tried to make it all signify, be revelatory, as if I needed that. But I couldn't, so I walked back to my car, my wife waiting in the heat, watching me curiously. We turned back toward the west and the distant invisible mountains and left that place forever once again. Thanks. Okay. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay. I have lots of questions, but I won't read them out because I think we've kind of had that point. Um, okay. Um, my first question. The last two years of my Minnesota philosophy book, I, the first reading that I've assigned, hold down to the big horn, play that one. <laughs> is an essay by Jonathan Franzen. Right. This is a, an essay that he uh, originally delivered as a convocation address at uh, Kenyon College in Ohio, yeah. I think, in May 2011, almost immediately reprinted in the New York Times, and it's now in his new collection, uh, Farther Away. And um, he's, a, he's a smart boy. He's very smart. And he, this isn't a piece of philosophy. It's wonderful writing and um, sharp analysis. And I also find it a very moving piece. And there's a, a reason why I assign it this week. Because, first of all, it, it opens with a discussion of our reliance on and our wonder at gadgetry. Because students these days come equipped with lots of gadgets. And trying to get them to, you know, start paying attention to, to work instead of on their phones is a, is a major task. And it's going to get more and more difficult. But anyway, the, 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 the distinction that he draws, which I find so important, is between um, the world the world of consumer preference, wanting stuff, wanting it to serve you, needing it to respond to you. If it doesn't, you get something else. Um, he contrasts this with what he calls the world of resistance. And he associates more than anything with the world of resistance, love, um, which can be love of another person, but it can also be love of something that you're, you're committed to, you that you're interested in. And the key difference between the world of consumer preference and the world of love is that the world of love demands something of you. Uh, it demands sacrifice. You don't always get what you want, except you can see how this might be a new way of loving your first year undergrad to do a philosophy course. Anyway. If you want to just scare them to death. Well, <laughs> um, but this is you three years before France was created. Um, you're talking about the lay of the land. The lay of the land is the third of Baskin novels. I believe, this is you talking, I believe that America is a country anesthetized by consumers, right to the point that we have become insensate to moral concerns beyond the perimeters of consumers. That's what the lay of the land reports to be true. A couple pages later, you say, love and its expressions are under attack by all these forces that we've been talking about. The forces that tend to drive people from each other or to blame others forces that tend to cause us to look away from ourselves and seeking satisfaction and redemption, whereas love is standing out there looking for us, waiting to console us, waiting to redeem us. But we don't look for it, don't imagine it, don't express it, but it isn't love's failure. I find this really intriguing because 
years before, for instance, I, I find wonderful piece. Um, you're drawing the same distinction between the urge for stuff and for that stuff to give you something on yeah. the one hand and, and yeah. love on the other. I mean, for, for, for me, when I say love, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about um, ethereal love. I'm not talking about abstract love. I'm talking about loving somebody. Yeah. I mean, there being another person whom you, whom you care about and uh, in, in, whom, in, in whose life you completely engage. And um, it, it has always seemed to me because that's what I, well, I don't know if it's because what I write about or, I, or, or the other kind of logic, but, but I've always thought that that's the, that's being with another human being is the laboratory for all of moral life. And, 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 and I don't mean by that moralistic life. I mean, just the way, you, and by, by moral life, all I mean is the way that you calculate good and not good is, is, is largely in your relationship, your intimate relationships with another human being. So that, that's been always, for me, the motive of, of, of what I, why I write what I write. I mean, and I'm an only child. I grew up more or less with a single parent, but I had a father who was great, but he was a traveling salesman, and he was gone all the time and then died in my arms just when I was 16. And um, we, we, were just, we were just pressed up together. And, and for me, that was all there was. They weren't educated people. I wasn't a good student. I, I, I came by those resolves hands-on, um, so to, to, to get to be a writer, that has, that has never seemed anything but obvious to me. I noticed, uh, first of all, let me get straight on the, the, your first reading. This is from a forthcoming collection of yes. novellas? Yes, it's called well, Let Me Be Frank With You. And are they, do they all feature Frank? Yes, they do. Okay. He, he narrates all of them. Okay. I, I, wrote, I wrote four novellas because I... I just didn't have the energy to write a big old 500-page novel, yeah, yeah. and, and I, I thought, yeah they, yeah, they are long, and I've been told how long they were many, well, I, many I times. Noticed, I noticed that in uh, your reading, Frank refers to, I think, himself or himself and his fellow Adamites as, in some sense, vestigial. That's yes. The word he used. Yes, it is. You use this word in an old essay of yours, uh, where you're referring to your profession as a writer. Yes. You refer to it as uh, a vestigial profession. Yeah. Um, what do you mean? Well, I, I, it, it, it may have been a momentary lapse of confidence, uh, but I, I mean, I, I, I feel like art of any kind uh, thrives in the cracks. And it really, particularly in the United States, it, it, the cracks are pretty narrow. And, um, and, and so I, I always think of, of, of art and, uh, and, 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 and whatever I do, whether it's artistic or not, or whether it's just, whether it's just you know, building walls, um, um, I, I always think of it as, 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 as trying to have to find its place. You know, in, in the United States, it's different from Canada in, in important ways. There's no place for writers in the United States. There's, the, the closest place that writers get in the United States is, is in universities, and that's fine if they can thrive there. But, but there's no, high, you know, America has a history of know-nothingism. It's not, it's not comfortable with intellectual pursuits. Writers, to the extent that they, that, that they elevate their, their work to the level of intelligence, is they don't have a place. Not to say that they're scorned. I don't think that they're scorned. There's just no place for them as there would be, say, in France. Um, so I always just think that writers in, in literature are scrapping always trying to keep from being erased by that stuff that Jonathan was talking about, the, the consumer culture and all those things we need but don't really want. Um, at the end of Canada, you um, sorry, dealt with Frances LeBron. Yes, line, yes. Uh, observes that because she's an artist, she can hold two opposites in her mind. Yes. Um, the, the theme of the importance of tolerating uh, ambiguity, not just tolerating, but appreciating, uh, seems to run throughout a lot of what you write. I was leafing through a book of yours that I really love, but doesn't get a lot of attention these days. It doesn't get mentioned as much as the Baskin novel. Um, your first one, um, Peace of My Heart. Yeah. I really love that book. Thank you. And um, 
just flipping through it, I, I stumbled upon three pages there where E.B. Henley is uh, telling Sam Newell that he, he doesn't appreciate ambiguity. He right? just can't manage it or master it. Uh, Frank, in The Sports Writer, when he's um, uh, sort of summing up his uh, couple of months at Berkshire College, this is among the things that he observes in a, in a generally um, even-handed and generously spirited assessment of these colleagues. I mean, he's not dismissive of no, these no. academics, one might be. No. Um, he, um, but um, among the things that he notes about them is their, their insufficient appreciation of, of ambiguity. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, last summer I was reading an awful lot of Eudora Welty. I had no idea you were coming, but I was reading a lot of it. And I remember a, a, a story of hers that I'm sure you know called um, A Memory. Mm -hmm. It happens on a beach. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite sure that this is, it, it involves her learning photography. But it, it seems to me that I, I, I imagine this girl is about 14. Mm -hmm. about She's a teenager. But I, it seems to me that one of the key insights of the narrator in that story is um, that uh, coming to be, that growing up involves being less rigid in one view, one's views and coming uh, to appreciate uh, ambiguity. Uh, so, uh, what's so great about ambiguity? <clears throat> well, um, I, I don't think in and of itself enduring ambiguity is a is a is a a moral good but I, but I do think that that if we could sort of live in the film of things a little bit longer than we do we might make fewer grievous mistakes um, I mean there's a there's a wonderful book called which some of you will have read if you're near more nearly my age than 12 uh, it's called the structure of scientific revolution by a man named Kuhn yeah, it's one of the really great books about about normal science, and um, and one of the things Kuhn says is is that what scientists do in their normal practice, because they're not probably going to win the Nobel Prize, they're probably not going to discover something something earth shattering, but they're probably going to do something good and advance normal science a little further. And the longer they can put off making rash conclusions, the longer that they can let their let their mind be open to the to, to new detail the, the 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 more informed they will be i mean how how many of us have bought a house and immediately had that horrible sinking feeling after buying a house <laughs> and, and and thought to himself or herself oh jesus if i had just stood back from this just a little bit and not been so plagued by not knowing and been Plagued by, indis you know, plagued by the fact that I that one or the other of the two people buying the house caused the other indecisive. If we just sort of let things sort out, and, and it's not just practical either. It's not just a means to an end. It is. It is, in fact, and I'll re relate this to writing novels. It, it it is, in fact, where most of life exists. And, and one of the things that we do as human beings is that we miss a lot of life. There's a great line of Landon, Randall Jarrell's that says, uh, the things we miss in life are life. And we're always, we're always wanting to finish something. We're always wanting to get out the door. We're always wanting to close the deal. We're always wanting to do this. We're always wanting to do that. Get to the end. Finish the story. But for a novelist, the place you want to be as a novelist is in the middle of your book. You don't want to have... You don't want to remember very much about the beginning, and you don't want to think too much about the end. Because if you're in the middle, A, that's where you are most of the time. And you should know that that's where you are most of the time and pay attention to every, the everydayness of it so that you can, in fact, like your life. And, and two, it's in the middle where you can actually make the most good of something, where you can understand things better, where you can make changes that will be consequential to the end when you ultimately decide to, 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 to travel there. So, so for me, putting up with ambiguity is, 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 is sort of fundamental to my way of thinking about the world. Uh, and, and, you, and if you don't like ambiguity, the, the, the two-sidedness of something, think of another name for it. I think I'm going to just keep asking questions. Uh, so if anybody, um, I should give the floor over to 
members of the audience, if anybody is, uh, if I see anybody lining up before the microphone, then I will uh, hand it over to you, okay? Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking questions. Okay, the remark by Randall Jarrell actually reminds me of um, one of my favorite uh, passages from um, Alice Munro's work. Um, it's a story called Accident in the Moons of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, uh, this is about a, a woman named Frances in 1943, I assume in Toronto, mm -hmm. a high school reading. And um, she's exchanging Christmas cards with friends. And it's clear that you see in, in the messages from the friends that uh, people are li living under the burdens of new responsibilities and various distractions and disappointments and so on. And the narrator says, most of them were in their 30s. Um, that age where it suddenly dawns on you that what you're living, the thing that you're living is your life. Mm. Now this seems to imply a distinction between what we imagine is going to happen to us and what we want to aspire to um, on the one hand and on the other hand the way things are, are yeah. and the way we are. Right. Now it seems to me this theme is very important to you. Yes, it's very it is. important to Dell. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Important to and me. Frank, too. It's important to me. Yeah. I don't want to miss. I don't want to miss that. I don't. I don't, I don't want to constantly have my own. I'm talking about my life and my life. Um, I don't want to constantly have my eyes on the horizon. I really want to have my eyes on my toes. Uh, that's, that's just. That's just. That's just native to me. Uh, I mean, my. I, I don't have. Sometimes people ask me, you know, what's the nature of your life? I say I do two things. I'm married to my wife, and I write books. And and that's all. We have children. We we we, we don't have. My, my family's all gone for the most part, and it's just it's just that. And I don't want to miss that because that's what's happening. And I'll be dead someday, and I don't want to miss it. And so, um, and that that actually, as an attitude, plays plays nicely into the to the thing that you were talking about in your so kind of introduction, which which was the observation of life as lived. Um, one of the things that literature does, realistic literature or any kind of literature, is that it inevitably is in its subject matter about life. No matter how weird or zany or experimental it might be, it's about life. And because it's about life, its moral position is that life itself is worth having this book be about it. And, 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 it's, and, it's, and its function as a, as, a, as a moral instrument is once you finish this book, to close it, and go back to life in some ways better. And that to, to, to me, the, the, the definition of literature that I care the most about is, is from F.R. Levis. And Levis said in an essay about D.H. Lawrence, he said, literature is the supreme means by which we renew our sensuous and emotional life and learn a new awareness. And for me, that's what I, that's what I think about every single day. How can I make what I write be a renewal of sensuous and emotional life through the agency of language and find something to create a new awareness. Because that's, you know, we all live our lives one breath at a time. There's a, a remark that uh, in your second novel, The Ultimate Good Luck, a remark that um, Ray makes to the main character, Harry yeah, Quinn, yeah. angrily. She says, uh, he says something like, um, I can, I've never been able to figure out what your life is in behalf of. <laughs> now, I was struck by this when I read it because it seems, it, it seems to me that what she's saying, I might be reading too much in this, but it seems to me what she's saying is, she might be just talking about very specifically why he came down to Mexico and et cetera, et cetera. Right. But, but it seems like she's saying, I don't know what motivates you. Yeah. I don't know what your I ideals are. I don't know if you're sense of purpose of why right. you do what you do. Right. And, but what's interesting about this to me is that it seems to me that, that Ray, when she says this, gives expression to a complaint that I imagine some readers would feel towards some of your characters. And, 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 and to its author. <laughs> <laughs> like what Frank <clears throat> says, uh, Frank says, for instance, there no, are no transcendent beings. Yes. When uh, uh, Bell <coughs> says near the end of um, near the session you were reading, but near the end of Canada, that there are no hidden meanings. Um, 
it seems like uh, the, the kind of reader who, who would be discouraged or, or depressed or annoyed at this, hmm. it seems that Ray, when she makes that remark, is giving expression to that. Now, Harry Quinn is a pretty laconic guy. He yes. doesn't accept this. He, he, he clearly um, rejects it, but he's so uh, laconic that there's no real sustained response. Right. Right. That was probably, it's the second novel I wrote, <coughs> it was probably a, the way, the, a way station along the way to <coughs> figuring out what the heck I thought about such things as that. Um, I mean, I, it, my, my students at Columbia, one of the things, in the, I, I teach a course called Being Smart on the Page, <coughs> which is a, a course about that. How, how, do you, how do you get, you know, how do you make novels that you write, stories that you write, be smarter than you are? Which is what you, which is what you hope, 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 hope will do. And one of the things we do is we ask what I think of as first principle questions. And one of the first principle questions I, I ask them is, do you think, because people in, who write novels are always writing characters. Characters is sort of the, you know, Virginia Woolf said that people wrote novels so that they could write characters. <clears throat> but I, I actually want to know, A, why people invent characters on the page. And more, more trenchantly to me, do they think that characters actually exist? Do you think human beings have characters? I happen not to believe that. I'm not a Christian. I don't, I'm, I'm kind of an Emersonian, but Emerson believes what I do not believe. Emerson believes that there, was, there are, just as he believes that there are transcendent truths, he believes that there are transcendent aspects of human beings that are their character. I, I haven't, I haven't never seen any evidence of this um, witness human behavior that they have characters. So, so that really was that that was a way station along the way to having Ray ask uh, Harry Quinn, basically, do you have a character? You know, what, 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 what are you all about? By and large, I think the whole notion of character is a construction from the ancients. Um, the, the, the goal of which was to make other people seem to be more knowable than they are, to, to seem to prescribe in them certain kinds of bad behavior and to prescribe for them certain kinds of predictable, perhaps good behavior. So, but, and, you know, this is the, if you deal in characters all your life, if you're constantly saying, what did your character do? What did your character say? You eventually begin to think, Jesus, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I, you know, and then you come to realize, I don't even think people have characters. And I see so, if they do, that mostly they're bad, and you know this about yourself, if you, what you think about your character, it's probably fairly disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> so give yourself a break. <laughs> just abolish the whole idea and just think I have a memory I have today, and I have what I might do tomorrow. Um, okay, I'm going to keep asking questions. Okay, please. Yeah, I think so. That's so, so the rest of the people in the back can hear you. Yes. Was it a cauchemar? Uh, That there are no stupid questions, there are only stupid answers. Well, my, my question is simply, uh, as you create, you're right now in the process of editing. Yes, sir. This very afternoon in the, in the Nord Nelson Hotel. And I'm wondering, can you suppress the creative part of your brain in a sense that you have a little notebook where you're scribbling in a phrase, a sentence, maybe to be used later in the thick of things when you're writing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's all I really wanted to ask. I, I, I do that. I do. No, 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 I, I, I don't. I, I, um, I, I don't have it with me. Actually, I have it in my briefcase. I don't have it with me because I'm always afraid I'll lose it. So I have to keep it. So I, I usually end up hiding it from myself. So 
<laughs> but I, yes, I do. I, I, and, I, and I keep those notebooks, if not religiously, at least continually. Um, because my mind is pretty much a sieve. And, and yeah, and I think it's not just a matter of age. I think it always has been. I mean, my, my, one of the continuing things Christina says to me, she said, Jesus Christ, she said, the things that go on in your brain. She said, because she's my, my wife's an urban planner and a mathematician and a, and a, a st statistician, and, and, and she, she, she's clear about things. <laughs> and I and I well she's had she's had to learn to like it. <laughs> it pays it's been paying the bills. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yes, sir. I you know I, I think that's actually kind of a glory. If if I weren't so obsessive about fearful being fearful of losing it, which once once or twice I have, I, I would think it was a great a great freedom to be able to note something down. You know, Ruskin and modern painters has a line in which she says Composition is the arrangement of unequal things. Composition is the arrangement of unequal things. What that means is, to me, probably meant something different to him, was that I'm always grasping things from here and there and everywhere, which end up in my notebook, and then I sort of, I sort of force them together almost mosaically, and, and out of those mosaical enjambments and abutments, I, I make a kind of a, a logic, a kind of a logic, and so. So that's where those uh, unequal things reside in my in my notebook. Then on John Beaumont was a French word. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> but I didn't want to say on Jean Beaumont. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Why don't you use that? Maybe that's still on. It's not. Okay, I'm sorry. It's not on. It's they. Yeah, it's, it's, it's they who need to hear you. We can hear you. I, I'm just really quite fascinated uh, that I want you to make a comment on why you called your book Canada. Yes. Yeah, you know, I should probably know because I didn't need it, but I'm quite... <laughs> I remember when it came out, and I said, what kind of person calls a book? <laughs> a really smart person. <laughs> here we, here I am. <laughs> um, well, uh, I can tell you, it's it's. Um, uh, uh, Canada, all my life, has been a, a as as a locus. It's always been, in, in a kind of impressionistic way, a good place. Every time I want, every time I've gone across the border, irrespective of where I've done it, and I've done it pretty much all across the 49th parallel, I, I, I felt, I, I felt what Catherine Ann Porter calls a commotion. I, I felt I'm, I'm leaving where I have been helplessly born, and and I'm entering a place that is freer than where I was helplessly born, and I, that's romantic. And I, and I know many of you would, might might dispute that, but probably most of you wouldn't. <laughs> Um, so, so when you when when, when I had when I have all my life had that feeling of, of of entering a good place, a place that just simply made my heart rise a little bit, my spirits rise. That kind of sensation is what Catherine Ann Porter calls a commotion. I said it before. It's what Neruda calls something kicking in my soul. When you when you have those feelings as a as a writer, and you don't have them very much. You have lots of good ideas that you write down in your notebook. You think to yourself, this is the smartest thing I ever wrote down. But when you ever visit them again, they don't have that resi residuum of commotion. They don't have that, 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 that feeling of, of zzz. And Canada always, as a place, had, had that for me. So I wanted to be able to set something there as much as I could. And then, and then in a, on, a, on, a, on a logographic way, uh, the word Canada was for me, insofar both as a as, as a word, and and as a um, a locus, uh, something I was very attracted to. I liked the th I liked the, uh, the the three A sounds Canada. I liked that. Every time I saw it on the page, I liked it. Whenever and I liked all, I liked the the three different consonantal sounds. 
Canada, and and I, I liked it that it had that galloping forward beat. I forgot the the, the foot it is. What is the what is what foot is that? One of you should know. It's a da 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 da. What is that? What is that metric foot? I no no. It's a, it's it's not an anapest. Anyway, I can't say it. Dactyl. It's a dactyl. Yeah, it's a dactyl. You're the teacher. You should know. Uh, it's a dactyl. Oh, no, a dactyl. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a three foot metric. It's a, it's a three beat metric foot. And I liked it every time I see it on the page. A lot of decisions in novels get made because the person writing the novel likes a certain word and wants to see that word recurrent in sentences. And, and so, and so when I realized I was happy putting Canada into sentences, and and that I had this commotion about in my life from places that were Canadian and going across the border, I thought that if that meant to me that Canada, and it's not symbolic, it's literal. Canada was literally, for me, a better place. And so I called my novel Canada because it represented to me a better place, a place of refuge. So that's why. But I mean, you know, but I'll, 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 I'll tell you the truth. It never occurred to me that anybody would think anything, particularly if one were Canadian. But, oh, good. <laughs> what, a, what a smart boy he was. <laughs> but, but some people have said to me, they said, God, I just can't believe you'd be so arrogant as to call your book after our country. But I mean, Kafka called America, America. So... Please. Um, uh, yes. Guy Davenport, a collection of essays called uh, Imagination. What is it? The Geography of the Imagination. There's an essay in there. Uh, there's an essay in there called That Fair Field of Anna, I think. And it's this incredibly impressive, learned discussion of the corpus of uh, the entire work of uh, Eudora Wellesley, but against the background in the context of Ovid's Metamorphoses. It's very hard to follow. It's so impressively learned. Uh, in the, I, think it's the, I think it's in the introduction to another book of essays, of his, another collection called Every Force Evolves, Evolves a Form, where he refers to that essay and Eudora Wellesley's response to it, which seems to have been one of just being utterly lost as Dis to what the hell he was dismayed. About. Yeah. Yeah, kind of dismayed. Yeah, and that's she, what she, that's where Eudora was. She she expressed this, he says, in a gentle and friendly way, but it was clear <laughs> she had no idea what, what he was attributing to. Uh, now what's interesting is that he goes on to say, in effect, and he doesn't do this, I don't think, in a arrogant way. Well, but but the gist of what he goes on to say is that Eudora Wealthy didn't understand everything that was going on in her work. Um, and so in other words, this has to do with the role of the critic, drawing things out that even the, of, of a work that even the, the, the writer himself or herself isn't even aware of. Um, and that, and that he, he saw that as a liability? Uh, he, no, he thought, thought that this was something that he was, a, a service he was providing and that a good cr critic provides to tell you you're about to that she herself doesn't even doesn't know about her own work. Anyway. That is certainly what critics do. Okay, well, this is what I want to ask. Have you ever learned anything about your own work from the critic? No. Okay. <laughs> but, it should, but it should be said, it should, it should be, yeah, let me just finish this and we'll, and we'll do it. It, sh it should be said, I, I don't read them either. Uh, ever since 1989, I, my, Christina said to me, you know, I would get all done in by a bad review. I've always gotten lots of bad reviews. And, um, and she finally said to me, she said, you know, these things cast you down so much. And, and the good reviews that you get don't seem to uh, compensate for that. Why don't you just quit reading those things? And we're, and we're not talking about, we're, we're talking about book reviews. We're not talking about Guy Davenport and scholarly learned essays. We're talking about something different in nature, but consequential also. But my job is for there to be as little discrepancy as possible between what I write 
and what I know the reader will think. And if, and, if, and if there, and the greater the degree of discrepancy between what I write and understand and what I understand the reader to think, there lies the lack of success of my work. And, and, I, and I, I mean, I'm a, you know, I was in the Marine Corps. I was, I'm just one of those kind of guys who just wants to run everything, control everything. I'm old now, so it's, I seem softer, but I'm actually not. Um, but, but I mean, within that structure, of course, readers are going to think all kinds of things that one couldn't predict because they come out of their own lives to, and they bring their own histories and their own memories, their own wishes to books, and they inevitably think things that the reader, or the writer, wouldn't have thought of. I mean, it's 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 prissy of of uh, of Davenport to write that. Is what is what it is. It's 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 I don't know. It's it's it's, it's he's like a little tailor's dummy. Uh, I mean I mean because it, it 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 doesn't sufficiently answer the question. So what? You know, that's why. Eudora Welty is Eudora Welty, and Guy Davenport is Guy Davenport. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, please. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, I think when people read fiction at that, that when people read a novel, when I read a novel, I read my novel, someone else's novel, they read their novel, they all went over the that, that probably happens. Yeah. How much planning so within that idea, how much planning do you do or do you do much planning or what is some of that process for you in terms of seeing the heart of a novel or do you kind of get busy and it kind of holds for you or No, no, I'm um I'm 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 a consummate planner. I usually spend a year not writing and a year planning. And um before I ever write the first savable sentence. Um, and what that planning for me <clears throat> requires is, and this is something I dreamed up, dreamed up as a way of doing it in 1982, because prior to that time, I was just a guy who would sit down and start writing, and it, it wasn't working out for me well enough. And um, so my goal is to spend a year writing down <clears throat> to a big, thick notebook all of the things that are important to me out of my accrued notebooks. I, I, I annotate my notebooks and then I copy them, I type them onto pages and I, and I begin to, in the process of typing my notes onto pages and getting those important things that I had been saving and savoring all of these years uh, down onto the page because I want to get them into a book because books are for me repositories of the most important things I know. I begin to think about <clears throat> Well, who could say this line? And, 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 you know, where could this take place? Well, I kind of like the word Canada. I'm going to want it to be in there. So I think it'll, part of this is going to take place in Canada because I want to have that word there. So <clears throat> I just keep on, keep on, keep on until I get a big, literally about a 300-page notebook, which is all divided with the little dividers that um, school kids use and, you know, the little tabs at the top that are, translucent green and blue and yellow and I, I one will say Dale Parsons and the other will say his mother and another one will say Canada and one will say Saskatchewan one of them will say Montana and so I, and, and inside each little divider it just just reams of notes and I study those things when I get them finally compiled for a long time until I begin to see what you described as the arc of a book coming out sort of osmotically out of all of that material and and it is a, it is it is a wonderful for me repository because it's got all of those things in it I I um, and I read it once a week ever how many pages it is I read it once a week because I'm looking for stuff to put in the next thing I'm going to write and I, I copy stuff off those pages onto three by five cards for each day's work I mean it's a it's a clerical hell <laughs> <clears throat> But it, but, it, but it accomplishes what you described. It accomplishes things not getting away from me. 
you know, if I ever have a good idea, I don't, I don't want to forget it like you were describing. I want to save it, and I want to see it again, and I want to reappraise it. I want to see if it was a good idea, and so I put it in that notebook, which I go to and look at and look at and look at and look at. Um, my, the reason for, for doing that, and I, I think there is a, a good reason for doing it, other than just that it gets books written, but it, it is important to me, and this is the thing that young writers have a hard time doing, it's important to me to get onto the page and into my book the most important things I know, so that the books will have those at their, dis at their disposal. When, when John Updike died, Adam Gopnik wrote a piece in The New Yorker about Updike. And I loved Updike. I, I liked him personally, and I liked his work. I thought he was a genius. I, I thought he was just a great, great, great writer. And, and Adam said about Updike, he said, Updike was a writer who, over the course of his life, managed to get himself fully expressed. And, and by that, he didn't mean that he, he, he got out, he got, that, that he wrote about himself, but that he got onto the page everything he thought was valuable, everything, everything he, he knew that was interesting, everything he knew that was morally of consequence, everything that should be the thing that fortifies a great book. Updike did that. And I, and I realized that that's, that's what I'm always trying to do, uh, win or lose. Please. Yes, ma'am. Well, here we are. It's a safe, it's a safe distance between us. <laughs> Yeah, it's the first time I ever came to Canada. Exactly. I mean, as a, as a writer. And uh, and uh, I heard you speak then. And with Tim with, with Timothy Finley. Yes. 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 I was actually there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I recall I recall I just wanted to you know say. Thank you for remembering. Thank you for remembering that. But that's that's not why I'm here, Wendy. Um, I, I was just uh, noticing when you were um, reading your excerpts about how important landscape is to you. Yes. And how you interpret <coughs> that landscape. And the one thing, and I'll, I just want to preface it with a story of my own, and then I'll ask my question. But um, many, many lives ago, I was uh, a reporter for an agricultural magazine from Ontario and had the opportunity to be in Des Moines, Iowa for an agricultural conference, which was, I have to say, probably one of the most boring things I've ever done in my entire life. But regardless, I was there. And uh, and talking to some of the folks there, it was me and one other Canadian journalist was there at the time. And we were chatting about, you know, where, where have you come from? And I, I said, well, I, I, I come from near Toronto, which was probably the easiest thing to say. And I ended up having to draw a map of the country and say, you know, most of the people live here, and then there's some people over here, and then there's some folks <laughs> over here. And then the person that I was talking to said, well, what's up here? And she pointed to the north, and I said, well, well it's not much. It's the north, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of wilderness. And she looked at me and she said, you still have a frontier? And it really just, and it never left me that concept uh, of, of not having developed. And I'm just, in your readings tonight, um, the reading that you did at first from your novella, um, where there's a going back and you're talking about, you know, that all the, all the physical space has been absolutely mapped. Out by yes. the skeleton, yes. you know, there is nowhere else to go. Um, that frontier has been mapped, and I wanted to. Uh, and then, of course, you're talking about you know your character standing in a wheat field yeah. with the disappearance of development. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask you to comment <coughs> about that dichotomy. That, yeah, that dichotomy, yeah. That that you're going through. Well. Um, I'm, I'm not a very romantic person. 
um, by nature, um, in, in the sense that if you think about a, a very romantic poem like Mont Blanc, um, and basically the, the hills are alive with the sound of music. Uh, and and, and for, for me, landscape is inert. It's inanimate. It, it doesn't cause things to happen. For, and for, and, and, and for, for me, uh, not, not in an ontological sense, but, but for me as a writer, it's slightly more complicated than that. I, I write landscapes the way I do because I want to create a plausible background against which the characters perform the things that I want them to perform. So I, I want Montana, Saskatchewan, the, the, you know, the hinterlands of central New Jersey, to be plausible, to be palpable for the reader because it, it, it's a context for the characters and it makes the characters seem themselves more plausible. Um, but as importantly to me, it's language because we don't need novels to go see Saskatchewan. We don't need novels to go see central New Jersey or any place or, or, or Nova Scotia. We, we, don't, we can go there. So what novels do has to be something different from what we can do ourselves. And what novels do for us regarding landscape is to is to let landscape motivate or inspire beautiful sentences, which may or may not be faithful to the landscape themselves. You may find discrepancies, but for me, it's all about it's all about language. For me, novels are interesting chiefly because of the individual words that the writer makes the reader read. And, and not about great themes, those come. Not about characters, those come. But about this word, and then that word, and then that word, and then that word. And so for me, to write about landscape is always about choosing a word, choosing a word, choosing a word. And, then, and, and that the, the, the experience is, is again, logographic. Um, and it's not, it's not primary, really, as, as landscape would be primary to us if we went into it. So. That's sort of the that's sort of my spiel uh, about about landscape, but I but I mean it, I I, I, I do mean it, um, um, you know I, I I the reason the moral reason for this is that when I grew up in Mississippi, helplessly born in Tube, Jackson, Mississippi, a really dismal place, uh, bigoted and, and 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 racist and churchy in the worst possible ways and small-minded and classist and all, all of the ists that we don't like. Uh, and, and, and people were always telling me when I was growing up there, God, this is the greatest place in the world. Jesus Christ, Mississippi. Man, oh man, is that wonderful. And I just, I, I just didn't experience that wonder, you know. And I, when I got to Michigan to go to college, I, I was immediately classed as a cracker. And I was from Mississippi. They thought I was a racist. They thought I was a Klansman, you know, all of these things. And what I realized was that I have got to take command of this. And I am not going to let, as an individual, landscape define me in any way. I am going to define me. I am going to take ownership of, of who I am and my acts. I'm not going to be able to say, well, you know, I, I did grow up in Mississippi, so I'm X or Y or Z. That, is it. that was a horrible thing to me because so much of those things were bad. So um, it was just a wish to, to make myself accountable to myself. And, uh, and being a novelist is a very good extension of a wish to be accountable. That's what writing novels is. It's an exercise in accountability. You were talking about critics before and your <coughs> disinclination to read. Uh, I was reading an interview the other day uh, with you. I think oh, sorry. You, sorry. mine works. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just referring to a couple of questions ago where, uh, still no? Did you turn it off? Maybe the battery went dead. Oh, maybe the battery went dead. Maybe I should just speak up. <clears throat> um, now you get to say, is this thing on? Yeah. Testing, testing. Is it okay? No. It's Ooh, this thing? Can I turn this thing on? We're going to ask one more question, then we're going to let y'all go. Okay. Well, it, I'll tell you what, this isn't even a question. This is, this is just an au revoir. Um, you talked about, um, 
Where, 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 where do they live? Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, on, uh, oh, Mr. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm uh, creative writing teacher. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Um, we have a small gift, um, but of course what you have, can you hear me okay? Well, of course what you have given us uh, is much greater than I can ever give you. Um, your I'll, be, I'll be the judge of that. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hearing your, uh, your thoughts about your process um, is invaluable advice um, and encouragement to uh, the emerging writers here at the Siren Line. Yeah. So it's worth it's worth your life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, on behalf of the students of St. Mary's and two of my classes, the whole class, all the students in those classes are here. So well, thank, thank you, you very thank much. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very nice of you. <laughs> Uh, two things. I want to read this. So, um, Richard was saying that he doesn't like to read critics, but in this interview that I read uh, from about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, he does identify a couple of critics that when he was a younger man he, he enjoyed. These were Frank Kermode yes. and uh, William Gass. Yes. Yes. So uh, William Gass uh, wrote a book called On Being Blue, yes. A Philosophical Inquiry. This is from the first page, and this is not a question. Um, uh, he, on the first page, he lists a range of things that he so associates with the color blue, which include for him afflictions of the spirit, dumps, mopes, Mondays, all that's dismal, low-down gloomy music, cyanosis, hair rinse, bluing, bleach. Nova Scotians. <laughs> he does. Anyway. In, in to, intolerable. Yes. In, intolerable. <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing that, uh, Al, well, first of all, again, uh, this evening wouldn't even have been arranged if it weren't for Alexander McLeod. He's put an awful lot of time into this for months. <laughs> Uh, one thing that he's impressed upon me from the very start is how, uh, over the recent years uh, of the Cyril Byrne lecture, they've aimed uh, to make it a festive occasion. So he wants me to emphasize this. <laughs> there's more music from Wendy and uh, Seth, and uh, there's for mu music and drinks behind. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you, and thank you to Thank Richard. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. I have a present for you. Okay. <laughs> thank you.